My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you guys enjoy this show and want to support it, you can do so by writing a review on iTunes or simply making a donation. Today, my guest on the show is Brie Petis. Brie is the CEO of MakerBot, which is one of the most innovative and disruptive companies leading the next industrial revolution by creating the standards in reliable and affordable desktop 3D printing. So without further ado, Brie, welcome to Singularity One on One. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Fantastic. The pleasure is entirely mine. And uh, we have a number of uh, audience questions submitted for you today. But before we get to those, um, can I ask you to please introduce yourself in your own few words? Sure. Um, I'm Bree Pettis, CEO of MakerBot. And my life, is ba my life is dedicated to empowering people to be creative, to unleash their in the innovation within. And I did that as a puppeteer. I did that as a school teacher. I did that making videos for Make Magazine. And I do that now making, video, uh, making videos as CEO <laughs> of MakerBot. <laughs> Which also involves <laughs> videos too. <laughs> involves making videos and giving interviews. Yes. Uh, now, but but that's a very interesting personal story. Tell us how you started up as puppeteer and a teacher. And, and I want to find out about the puppeteer end of things too, because I know some about the teaching end. But and then you eventually mm -hmm. end up being the CEO of this highly disruptive, revolutionary three D printing company. You know, uh, one foot in front of the other, and. Um, I try and keep myself in my life. I've tried to keep myself open to opportunities and say yes when something seems exciting. And uh, you know, I've taken some risks, but for the most part, I just love thinking. I, I just love. I'm. I love thinking about what happens next and and trying to make that happen. So, um, you know, I got into puppetry and got was lucky enough to end up working for Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Making you know pushing rubber gorilla technology farther than it had ever gone before, <laughs> and uh, and ended up getting into uh, puppetry, starting at my own little puppet theater, doing a bunch of workshops with uh, in schools, and then ended up really liking working with young people. So uh, did was got my teacher certificate and became a school teacher for seven years in Seattle Public, and. You know, then I ended up basically making videos for my students because I found that when I was teaching them, if I made a video of myself teaching them, they would actually pay more attention to the video version of myself than to me just standing right there. So uh, one thing led to another, and the next thing I know, I was making, I was sharing them with the internet, and people were downloading, people were watching them. So. Um, that kind of, I ended up getting this gig, and then that led into getting a gig at uh, where I had to make a video every week, where I had to make something. And this, d this need to make something every single week and make a video about it and a PDF explaining it so that other people could make it too and take it farther. Um, that really, that, I, you know, that, you know, that's really powerful. I ended up writing this thing called the Cult of Done Manifesto, which is basically based on my, that time of my life where I had to make stuff, I had to get stuff done so I could get more stuff done. And then I uh, ended up starting a hackerspace here in New York City called NYC Resistor with some friends. And out of that grew MakerBot. So it's, you know, it seems like a, you know, crazy thing, puppeteer, school teacher, but it was just one foot in front of the, front, in front of the other the whole way. And with the with my intention to spend my life empowering people to be creative, it just opportunities happen, and I and I take them. That's amazing. You are there also a, a very popular podcaster too, which I should have mentioned during my introduction. Yeah, back in the day. Yeah, and I, you know, I think I was like the thirteenth video video podcaster, video blogger back in the day. But um, well, yeah. the, the lucky number thirteen for you. <laughs> But but let us let us uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, MakerBot. So sure. what what is MakerBot, and uh, perhaps you can tell us something about the products and stuff. Sure. So you know, MakerBot is a company of and and it's you know a group of really smart people who all share the same vision and mission to empower the world with three D printing. And so we make. 3D printers, and we make 3D scanners, and we make software that supports this, and we really want the world to be more a more creative, more wonderful, more innovative place. And 
for individuals, that means they get, you know, to basically have a factory on their desktop, have a MakerBot on their desktop. And you know, basically back in the day, you had to be a tycoon to be able to have access to a factory. Now you just need a MakerBot and a good idea. Um, and then, you know, we just kind of pretty exciting stuff just happened. We just launched three new 3D printers, the uh, MakerBot Replicator Mini, a small MakerBot, the MakerBot Replicator Desktop, which is really the medium-sized MakerBot, and the MakerBot Replicator Z18, which make, allows you to make things that are 12 by 12 by 18 inches tall, wow. which means you can make full-size human busts. You can do all sorts of crazy. It, it's going to just, I cannot wait to see what people do with this. And so uh, behind that, we also have the software, which is just important. We actually, we spend a lot of time, energy, and money developing software that if we do our job right, it's easy and you don't even think about it. So um, the software behind it, we've got a desktop application, a mobile application, and a, a creative tool, MakerBot Print Shop, that lets people create things easily. Um, the whole idea is to just unlock people's creativity and let the innovation flow. Yeah, the, the apps are usually as important as the, the actual hardware. And you guys have a very good reputation about sort of updating and upgrading the firmware of previously previous generations of your hardware so that it actually improves its, its capabilities in the end, right? Yeah, and I mean, it's actually, we, we take a lot of pride and we take a lot of feedback from the community. Um, basically... When we launch something, we we make the hardware, you know, we make the hardware rock solid, and then the software, we make a we do a, give it a best first shot, and we make it really nice software, and then we take people's feedback and we we use it. So when we launched the MakerBot Digitizer Desktop 3D Scanner, at first you put something on it and it just made one pass and it made one scan, mm. but that meant that you didn't see the stuff on the bottom. So we changed the software. We actually spent a lot of time and energy making it so that you could do one scan, and then you could turn it on its, your object on its side and scan it again and merge those scans to make a better 3D model. Mm -hmm. And our commitment to improving the software just means that, you know, when, what it, when you buy a MakerBot now, it's, it's literally just going to get better with age. Let me ask you about the printing resolution. How is sure. that developing, and what, what level are we at right now? You know, we've gotten to the, 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 the place where printing resolution doesn't really matter. It's interesting. We used to, you know, when we launched the MakerBot Replicator 2, we talked a lot about how about 100 micron layer resolution, and, you know, that's about as thin as a piece of paper. So when you make stuff at that resolution, it just, it's really, really smooth. You pay, it's a trade-off with time. The higher the resolution, the, the more time it's going to take. Mm -hmm. The lower the resolution, the faster it's going to make it what, what you want. Mm -hmm. And for most people, the standard resolution of 200 microns is perfectly fine. And that's, that's all they need. And it makes just beautiful things. And, it, and it's a good balance between resolution and how much time it's going to take. Mm -hmm. But I will say, we don't really talk. I mean, even though it's important that people know that they, they get the best when they get a MakerBot. Um, it's becoming less about the uh, like the the statistics, the the, the specifications, specs. yeah. and more about what you can do with it. So, mm -hmm. the ease of use turns out to be really important. We've got people who have roomfuls of every three D printer in the world, and they end up using their MakerBot all the time because you can literally like be like I can be in my office here and I can go, oh yeah, I want to make something. I'll go to Thingiverse, I'll download it, I'll open it up in MakerWare, I'll slice it. I'll put it on an SD card, and I'll walk over to the MakerBot and start it. And that can take me like a minute, minute and a half. And so I can literally be like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom, but I want to start a print first, go through the whole process, start the print, and go to the bathroom without stressing out. So wow. that workflow is actually, it's probably more important than the actual specifications, even though the specifications are awesome. So we're talking more about like what, what you can make with it rather than the machine. And I think this is kind of normal uh, evolvement of technology. You know, back in the day, when you bought a 2D printer, you, the box had a picture of the 2D printer and a list of all the specifications. Now you just want the thing to be reliable and you want to be happy. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you, you don't, you want to, it's a little bit of a different game as, as, the, as the product matures. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're saying it's already reached that point of maturity where resolution practically disappears in the background and on the foreground we have ease of use, Probably uh, price. How about the price? 
What, what's the price range of your new products that you mentioned, the, the three new newly launched products? So one of the cool things about the new products is there's no compromises. Each of them has the same extruder, a professional grade extruder. Each of them has the same electronics inside them with the, the same software, this professional grade software. So even though these three printers are all three different sizes, they're all, there's no compromises if you get the small one. You're literally just getting a smaller build volume. And the, at the, at the, 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 the small end, the consumer end, it's uh, $1,375. And then the medium one, the MakerBot Replicator, is uh, $2,899. And then at the high end, you've got the MakerBot Replicator Z18, which is $6,499, which if you go out and look at other 3D printers that have that build volume, it can be, you know, it, it's, a, 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 it's just a fraction of the cost of any comparable 3D printer of the build volume. So, mm. And the cool thing is, because they all share the same infrastructure, you're really getting whatever size machine you get, whatever size 3D printer you get, you're getting a professional level machine. Let, let me ask you this, though. Are they already pre-built? Because the original models, uh, you had to kind of hack and put together <laughs> yourself. Are, are, are those prices that you're quoting for already pre-built machines, or do you Absolutely. have to finish yeah, them? We've built them. We've sent them through a, a regiment of testing before they go in the box, mm -hmm. and you get them ready to rock. Plug and play, one-touch 3D printing on the small one. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, when we started, though, I have to give a shout-out to our early users, because when we started, we shipped kits. And you had to really be into it because it, it's a complicated thing. It would take people weeks and months to assemble their MakerBots mm -hmm. from uh, that, that they bought in like 2009. Um, now we've we made it in order to kind of go for the the bigger the bigger mission of a MakerBot on every desktop in the world. Uh, we have to make it easy for people. We had to move away from that and. It's interesting, we actually, with the MakerBot Replicator 2, and the MakerBot Replicator, when we start, when we announced that we were going to make fully assembled 3D printers, a small portion of our community was like, ah, oh, I really like making them. <laughs> and so we said, I'll tell you what, we'll, 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 if you want, really like making them, we'll put it together, we'll test it, and then we'll take our lunch hour, and we'll take it apart and put it in the box for you so you can put it together and enjoy that. <laughs> and uh, nobody took us up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually remember interviewing Eric Boyd, who is the president of uh, Hack Lab Toronto. Oh, yeah. And a couple of years ago, and they had one of the earlier versions there. Uh, you know, which a was, lot of those machines are still in use. So yeah, I, I, I am absolutely sure it still is. <laughs> and we've really focused, one of the things that we focused early on is having things being modular and, and um, serviceable. So <clears throat> we're, we don't make it impossible to take this thing apart. We make it so that, you know, if... You want to if you want to change something up, or if you you know if you roll it downstairs and you need to buy some parts and assemble and, and fix it up, it's really easy to work on these machines. We didn't make it hard for them to. We made it so it's very serviceable. So if you're a tinkerer, you can still get into the hood and see how it works. And what about the filament? I know that you're using this PLA sort of renewable bioplastic made of corn kind of a filament. Yep. Is that biodegradable when you say made of corn, renewable? Does that mean that once you print something and you, if you if, say if you throw it, would it biodegrade by any chance? It, uh, it, it, I think the, the appropriate phrase is compostable. Biodegradable is actually a technical term that requires that something break down with a certain amount of time. Yeah. So actually like cups, if you were to make a cup out of this, out of this material on your MakerBot, and it had a very thin wall. You have a very high surface to volume ratio. Yeah. It would break down very fast. It would biodegrade very fast. But being biodegradable is actually a technical term that if you were to make something that was solid, your surface area to volume ratio changes, and so it would take longer for it to biodegrade. So officially we can't say that it's biodegradable because that's a technical term that requires a certain time frame of breakdown ability. Mm -hmm. And because we can't control the end user's parts, yeah, yeah. Um, How thick they're it, going to print. It will biodegrade, but it won't biodegrade within... Uh, it, we can't guarantee that it would biodegrade within the technical specifications of, biodeg of biodegrading. Does that make I, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, sort of the technical answer. It totally yes, it breaks down in your compost pile. Depends on the shape of it is how fast it is. Fantastic. 
Now, what about one of the most common questions submitted by listeners today is what about other colors and especially other materials? Yeah. So I think we've got more than 30 colors at this point, and we've got a lot more coming. We really want people to be able to make things in different colors. And you know, we've done, we did experiments with dual extrusion. We actually still sell the MakeAbout Replicator 2X, which is a two-color machine. And what we ended up finding is that people wanted to make multicolor things, and the best way to do that was to make things in multiple pieces and assemble them. When you look at the plastic things in your life that are different colors, you see that, like, you know, like this little, uh, this little taxi, it's actually two colors, but it's actually a lot of different parts that have then just been snapped together. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing with 3D printing. You make, if you want to make something in multiple colors, you just make multiple parts and snap them together or glue them together. Mm -hmm. And what about multiple materials? So I have a very large material science team that's working on that. And um, we have a couple materials. We have the MakerBot, uh, MakerBot PLA filament, which, as you mentioned, is a renewable bioplastic and just a ton of colors, including uh, you can have solid colors or translucent colors. We've got some sparkly colors um, with sparkles in them. And then we've got ABS, which you can use with the MakerBot Replicator 2X. And that's a more traditional bioplastic. It shrinks more. It's more fussy plastic, but we've got lots of colors in that. And then we have the MakerBot Flexible Filament, which you can use in the MakerBot Replicator 2, which is a, uh, it, uh, it allows you to make things that then can be flexible, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Brie, let me ask you, what, what is the most exciting upcoming product that you can tell us about? You know, one of the downsides about being a public company is it's actually illegal and I can go to jail for telling you about upcoming products. But what I can tell you is that we're really focused on making this easier, more accessible, more friendly, and we're just going to keep doing that. We've done that from the beginning. We're going to keep doing that. And, you know, my goal is to empower everyone to have access to, to a MakerBot 3D printer. And so we're just going to keep, keep pushing and pushing and pushing to make that happen. By the way, uh, speaking of uh, more accessible, I mean, cost is a very huge uh, factor here. So uh, I forgot to ask you, how does the cost of the filament add up? How does it compare? So what we do is, from the beginning, we have wanted to have very high quality filament at the lowest price we can justify charging. Because our goal is... We want people to get it and feel like they can just try something. We don't want them to be stressed out about how much it costs. So a roll of MakerBot filament can make almost 400 chess pieces and cost $48. Wow. So you can really think of it like when, you, when things cost cents instead of dollars to, to, to make, you, can, you, can, you don't have to stress out about the cost of the material and you can just be free to let your imagination soar. And you can try things much earlier. You can say... This might be a bad idea, but you know what? I'm going to try it anyway. And that's super powerful because so often the hardest part of any project is just trying, getting that first thing to go, first, yeah. first, first try. Yeah, I think uh, the Chinese have a proverb that says even the longest journey starts with a single step. Yeah. And that single step is usually the toughest for people to make a decision on. Uh, and you said in the beginning, following one step at a time, you know, putting one foot behind the other. But that first step is, is quite yes. often crucial to, to get you going on the journey. And I mean, I can see how your products can totally create incentives for people to just give it a try because they, they've got nothing to lose. But let me move on our discussion here to some more general and, if you will, more philosophical questions. So let me begin by asking you, what are your work's motivation and goals ultimate motivation and goals well i think um at, for makerbot we're out to empower people we're happy when our customers our users makerbot operators are being creative and innovative we want to live in a future where that's better where people have more access, where people have more power. They get, you know, and when you have a MakerBot, you get this superpower. So we're highly motivated by that. And so that also connects to accessibility, getting these out there, doing a lot of education, just showing people what's possible. So much of what our challenge is, is telling them 
they can do it. So many people think, oh, a 3D printer, that's something, you know, for engineers. But it's not anymore. We've made it easy and friendly enough that anybody can use it. So that's one of our challenges. And then I think, you know, we're always just striving to be better. We want to we want to we want to be sharper. We want to be uh, we want to we, we just always want to be, you know, an improvement. I heard you once say that you want to democratize manufacturing. Would you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, that's, you know, yeah, I, and I believe that. But we are out to make this technology accessible and friendly and make it so that, you know, you don't have to be somebody with a factory to be able to come up, have an idea and get it out there in the world. So, so let me ask you this then. How important is open source for you within that process or that goal to democratize manufacturing? You know, we actually started as a, a, <clears throat> a very hardcore open source company, and, and we made a lot of mistakes. One of our first mistakes was we started to share, we shared our development. We had, a, we had launched the MakerBot Cupcake, our first machine, and then we uploaded the plans for our next machine just months after launching that machine. And it was just the seed of an idea. There was another, like, 12 months of work to do to, to really develop it. And our users saw that we were working on a new machine and they stopped buying the current one. And we actually almost lost the company because we just didn't have, luckily we weren't paying ourselves and there wasn't a lot of cost because mm -hmm. we, by being so open, we ended up shooting ourselves in the foot as a business. Um, what we do have that's really, and later on we ended up um, uh, closing the, I got a design patent because we were getting knocked off. People were taking our designs, shipping them to China, having labor that, you know, paying people a dollar an hour to make clones that weren't as good and selling them as if they were our 3D printer. Mm -hmm. And then we, that caused all sorts of problems. So I had to put a stop to that. Um, what I would say is one of the places that we're, we see a lot of amazing open work happening is on Thingiverse. And that's because people are sharing, they're not sharing out of a sense of needing to get paid for things. They're sharing out of a sense of, I made this, I want to show this to the world, I want to let the world build on this and keep going forward. This is the same spirit that I had when I made videos and tutorials and all this kind of stuff. So we have a very, I would say, we have probably, a, you know, open source is one thing, but one level up is, is sharing. And we're dedicated to sharing as much as we can. And so, you know, we take, when we launched the MakerBot Replicator 2, our, actually our extruder was a little complicated. It was a great extruder, but it was a little more complicated than it needed to be. And our community actually said, ah, here, try this. And we tried it, and sure enough, it worked better than the one we had made. And then we went ahead and we made that one better. So we improved on that. So I think that there's a real back and forth that can happen, and I think companies that share with their community get a huge advantage. I think that when you mix, you know, open source specifically works best when there isn't a company involved, when it's a community project. When you, you, know, you look at projects like GIMP, the image manipulation tool, you look at projects, you know, like even on GitHub, a good chunk of GitHub is open source and a good chunk isn't. So I think what you see is as much as you can share, it's a good idea. And we've done that. Let me follow this up with a couple of other questions. Now, to me personally, one of the, the ways, uh, and apparently there are many problems with that too, but, but one of the best ways to perhaps democratize manufacturing is if you can have a printer that can print a copy of itself. So, and the, one of the great things is that there's a project out there called RepRap. And actually, our first investor was Adrian Boyer, creator of the RepRap community. And the good thing is, is if you have a, a, you know, and MakerBots have created a lot of RepRaps, and then those RepRaps have created more RepRaps. I, I will say it's not for everyone. If you're the kind of person who, if you're the kind of person who wants to make a 3D printer, you can absolutely use a 3D printer to make a 3D printer. And it's, it feels awesome and it's great. Um, if you're the kind of person who just wants to make stuff with 3D printers, then you get a MakerBot. Um, and it's interesting. A lot of people make 3D printers with MakerBots, and that, I, that makes me happy. I like that the RepRap project is supported by MakerBot. And to be fair, 
we were actually, you know, I got my start contributing to the RepRap project. My first, my first 3D printer was a McWirebot, which actually was called a RepStrap uh, 3D printer because it wasn't a, a 3D printed 3D printer. It was like that we made it out of uh, plumbing, thick, like pipes and stuff like that. So um, let, let me give you this yeah. one of the more critical sort of questions that was sure. submitted by a, by a viewer uh, named Karen. Chapek Carr, uh, and he asks, how does he feel about using RepRap and Arduino technology and efforts and giving nothing back, not even a credit? Uh, we give credit. We give a lot back. We give a lot of credit. You know, there's some people who are grumpy about that, and I can't stop that. But, and I've got some significant trolls in the RepRap world. And what people have to understand is that RepRap is very powerful. And it's a great force in the world for people to create 3D printers from scratch at home. It's not for everyone because it takes a long time. Having built a lot of 3D printers, it can be very fussy and it takes a lot of work. But I, I, I would argue with that, that actually by creating Thingiverse, by creating this, this, this platform for people to share, we've actually done probably, I mean, we've done... I, we've, I've literally contributed millions and millions of dollars of work hours of, my, of our employees to open source projects that are still out there. Our original design, our original tool, uh, Replicator G, great tool, still out there, totally open. People can do whatever they want with it. They can grow it. And in fact, our competitors did, in fact, use it and, and benefit from it, as well as the RepRap community. So I would kind of put that back and say, you know, we do give credit to, to RepRap. I just gave credit before you asked me the question saying, hey, we, we were really, you know, that's where we got our start and then we took it in a different direction. I think what people have to understand is that a project is different than a product. When you work on a community project, it's very powerful to share everything because there's no money involved. And if you benefit, you get, you, everybody pays it forward. Um, as a product, we had to make something that just works. And that required a lot of, and, and we invited the community to participate with us. At some point, the project became difficult enough that we weren't getting contributions from the community. There were like four people who were contributing. And it didn't make sense to keep going in that direction. Do I encourage, do I support it happening? Yes, I mean, I buy, I buy 3D printers that, on uh, Kickstarter and I love it when they're open. Um, I. I talk about the RepRap project and, you know, Adrian as an investor in MakerBot benefited significantly from his investment in MakerBot. So in many ways we've given just frankly him a lot back. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think it's a, uh, I think that if, if I were running RepRap, I would probably wish that it got more attention as well because it's a really cool project. I'm not the person to do that because I have a 3d printing company, mm -hmm. but I think that it, it really deserves attention. My last question within this realm would be kind of this sort of very tough question, uh, very complicated too, but let's see what we make out of it within the limited time we've got. Uh, so Karl Marx's greatest, it's still on the topic of sort of democratizing uh, manufacturing, right? Karl Marx's greatest criticism of capitalism was that sort of the bourgeoisie had full control of the means of production. Now, with, with what you call the democratization of manufacturing, basically on every desktop, people would almost have control over manufacturing, over the means of production. How do you think that would impact on capitalism? I mean, there are many people who are, you know, saying that the bottom line of this is that sort of 3D manufacturing technology is, is kind of one of the, signs that capitalism is coming to an end that you know once we get the blueprints of everything and we get over the limited you know materials that we're using at the moment eventually we would live in sort of a utopian society where everybody would be able to print anything at will and therefore no monetary exchanges would need to happen and capitalism would be finished how do you feel about all that i mean i kind of you know i'm not a politician and i'm not a philosopher so I can't, really, I can't really claim to be an expert on all this stuff, but I think it's worth looking at what happened with uh, the rise of personal computers. Um, did personal computing and, uh, you know, end the use of 
Book sales? No. People still write books. Um, did personal computing and, um, you know, news? It might, but it still hasn't. It's been a long time and it still hasn't. So I think that um, while there are people who, would lo who love to explore the possibility of, okay, I can make everything now. I absolutely don't need any infrastructure. I don't need government. I don't need all that kind of stuff. I don't think that that's a very short-term realistic kind of way of thinking. What I see is that individuals can get a lot of leverage by having these. You know, if you're the person at your job with a MakerBot, you're going to be able to make things faster. You're going to be able to keep your job, more, you're more likely to keep your job than other people because you're going to have that superpower. When I, uh, when I think about um, how people use this in business, actually businesses use MakerBots to accelerate the manufacturing process. So it's not just individuals who are using them. We sell them to businesses that use these to accelerate the, the, the process. We also see it become a, as a tool that turns ordinary people into entrepreneurs. And so I think that the idea that, you know, I, while I, I think it's a, a fun exploration for philosophers to explore the possibility of what happens when everybody has the means of production, I think that the realistic thing is we have to think it's not just everyone as a citizen, but it's every, every community. What, we, we start seeing these things pop up in libraries. What happens when every library has a maker bot? What happens when every school has a MakerBot and students have access? And I don't think it necessarily means the end of manufacturing. A lot of people would love to say like, oh, great, this means the end of manufacturing. But when we see manufacturing using MakerBot 3D printers in their practice, it doesn't end their business. It just accelerates it. It makes it possible for them to innovate faster, for them to accelerate that process and and make it more affordable, more accessible, more friendly for people to get into it. So I think rather than ending manufacturing, it may actually end up creating a whole group, a whole class of people who have access to manufacturing and don't have to go to a four-year institution and don't have to go be trained in a manufacturing facility because they're going to have that experience when they get a maker bot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me move on our discussion here with another question submitted by science fiction writer William Hurtling, uh, who is uh, asking you on the topic of the Thingiverse. So his question goes like this. In the music, books and app realms, devices are, are good, but content is king. Apple, Google, Amazon have all had devices, but the ec ecosystems they create around delivering content is what gives them influence and profit. In the long term, what's more important to MakerBot, the 3D printers or the Thingiverse? I think it's actually bigger than both of those. I think that for us, we talk a lot about the ecosystem because we want it to be, an, we want it to be friendly and easy and accessible. And you know, it's interesting. Some people say like, "What's the killer app for 3D printing? What's the thing I'm going to make on my 3D printer that's going to make me want to buy one?" And I don't think that's really the right way to approach it. I think it is actually, now that we've developed an ecosystem, you can actually enter it and the killer app may be that you can make anything. I mean, it's kind of like asking like, which song is responsible for music being popular? <laughs> right? Um, I like that. I think that every, every, everybody, I mean, my first, uh, my first tape, was Michael Jackson Thriller, right? That's what did it for me. But I'm sure, your, what was your first music? What did you Beatles. first get? The Beatles. You got Beatles? Yeah. So the Beatles hooked you. So I think for, I mean, I think the Beatles might have been the killer app for music, quite honestly. I think they, might, they probably did more to make it popular. They cre really, in many ways, created pop music. Yeah. But people were listening to music for, you know, thousands of years before that. We can't credit the Beatles with creating music, probably, but making it accessible, making it, I, you, know, you look at the Beatles, but then you also like, how did you get that? You probably went to a record store. The record store had to exist. The labels had to exist. The infrastructure for making records or whatever. Well, I grew up in communist Bulgaria, so there were no record stores and stuff like that. I, I, we had like one of those uh, tape things. I don't even know how you... Cassette order. tape deck or eight tracks? No, yeah, eight tracks, not cassette tapes. Those were very <laughs> rare. So you had to actually take the tape and run it through the thing and sort of twist oh, it yeah, around yeah. and, and play it. 
<laughs> yeah, so so that's the first time I, I actually heard music was on, on such a device. And it was the Beatles, and it totally blew my mind. What album was it? Oh, I, I don't think it was an album. It was probably like... Twist and Shout or something? Yeah, well, it was more like Yesterday or Let It Be or something. Oh, or so Girl. Like yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that would do it. I mean, yeah. the White Album blew people. Yeah, that would do it. Totally. Cool. Totally. Um, so, so, so let me follow this up with, with another question by Jacob or, or Zwelski. Uh, and he's asking you, I would like to hear about his view about copyright laws, but which kind of goes to the previous topic, but how is that kind of notion fit within the Thingiverse? Where do copyright laws fit within the, the, the Thingiverse? You already mentioned some of them are open source, some of them sure. are not. How does that work? Well, everything on Thingiverse has been put up there with the intention of sharing. So um, you, you get to choose a Creative Commons license when you upload it there. So and you're, you're actually giving people the ability to copy it when you, you're, that's implicit when you share something on Thingiverse. There are, have been cases where, you know, we have to abide by the laws of the country we work in. And so we're, uh, we abide by the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. If somebody believes that somebody is infringing on their copyright, they can send a cease and desist, and we have to, we have to abide by that. Um, it's interesting. I think that it's still a frontier to be explored in terms of the realm of things because most copyrighted stuff is limited to um, artistic works, whereas which falls under copyright. So our copyright and artistic works are together. When things are practical, they actually don't fall into copyright or patent law. And when things are physical, they usually have to, it usually has to be a patent rather than a copyright. Uh, there's a guy named Michael Weinberg who's done a lot of work actually trying to explain this to people. He does it better than I do. So I would point to him and go look at his work. Yeah, I would highly recommend actually Cory Doctorow. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Recently, he wrote a fantastic piece in The Guardian uh, explaining why DRM is the root of all evil. Um, and, and especially the way it's been implemented through that act that you quoted and stuff like that. So he's not in principle opposed to it, but he's very much opposed to the way it's been implemented. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other topic. So let's move on our discussion with what are the most applications for you? the most exciting applications for you on the Thingiverse? We were talking about songs and how everybody has a different favorite. So w which ones are yours? You know, for me, um, I'm actually making stuff for my daughter right now. So I get to be a superhero to my family where if something breaks, I can fix it on a MakerBot. And then we just launched this thing, the MakerBot Digital Store, which is models that we've created that are really great, very compelling. You know, I've got some here. I've got a dragon. Um, let's see if I can see this here. Oh, that's like, yeah. Wow. So this is really cool. Um, let me see if I can hold it up so you can see. And it's interesting. You can actually take its head off and there's, I've got another head here. <laughs> <clears throat> you can choose, uh, this head as well. So this is the normal head. There's the dragon head. And then you can take this one off and this one is breathing fire. So, wow. you know, and then let's see. I've got a wizard. How old is your daughter? Um, she's almost three. Wow, perfect time for these toys. Oh my gosh, yeah. And then on top of that, there's a whole uh, there's a whole castle, and I need to paint this paint this castle and these characters so because they, they, they're all red right now because that's what I have in my MakerBot. So little castle with little knight on top, and um, what else? This is a. Uh, from Thingiverse, this is 3D Kit Bash. They share this on Thingiverse. This is a fish that uh, swims, and is, wow. it, it prints all in one piece, and then it, and then it looks like this. So that's that's pretty cool. I mean, what else do I have on my desk here? There's a uh, oh, there's a game called Siege S E E J, which is a game where you make catapults, and um, and uh, so I've got a catapult. You have oh, a catapult can... that you make, and then you've got a bunch of bricks that you make, and you, can and shoot you play down a the game walls. where you try and get through the, catap the, the bricks with the catapult and knock over the little flags. And, wow. Uh... wow. Fantastic. 
what That's about what right now? What what about the other like general sort of applications of your maker bots? Like I've heard you talk about NASA. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, so actually at the Singularity University, you have a really interesting group called Made in Space that is on track to put a 3D printer in on the International Space Station. Um, that's so cool. Uh, the other, when, you know, we, some of our biggest competitors, or not competitors, some of our biggest customers, excuse me, use MakerBots to explore space. So uh, NASA, JPL, when a engineer needs to prototype something that's going to be expensive, they just buy the engineer MakerBot, put it on their desk, and then they just have that. Rather than having to pay, you know, the first time they bought something, it was like the prototype was $5,000, and the second time they made it, they just bought a MakerBot. Um, we just did a great video piece on Lockheed Martin, which had to do a, uh, they had to do a fix on the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the next generation space telescope. And the telescope was in the cryo chamber, which is where they freeze it as close to Kelvin as possible, and they suck out all the air to like give it the same experience as if it was in space. And they, they let it sit in there for a while to see if anything breaks. And while it was in there, they realized that they, they were going to have to fix something. So they makerbotted a replica of the part of the telescope they were going to fix. And they, then they makerbotted, used their makerbot to make the parts that they were going to need to fix it, baffles to keep cosmic rays from hitting a certain sensor. And then they even make her about it, the tools that they were going to have to use. And they practiced for like a month. And then when it came out of the cryo chamber, they were, they, had al they were all ready to go. They had all the pieces. They put it in there, and they just fixed it right away. So wow. they figure it saved them months and months of time. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. So, so let me ask you this. Uh, it's another audience question by Mike Cassidy. What will be a couple of the biggest leaps in the design of 3D makers that you hope to accomplish in the next few years? You know, I'm really excited to see what students do. I think that we're going to be really surprised by what young people do with this technology. I think that if we can just let them at it, they're going to do more than we can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. and, and that connects with the next question by Cynthia Stewart, who is curious as to the perceived limits of 3D printing. Are there any well-defined parameters? Well, there's material science. I mean, we're bound by what you can, you know, by the uh, periodic table for now. Um, and uh, so there's material science. There's the build volume of the 3D printer. I mean, at this point, the biggest maker by you can get makes things that are 12 by 12 by 18 inches. If you want to make things that are, but, you know, the true maker by operator doesn't see that as an obstacle. I mean, we've got folks like, uh, like this is a model by Cosmo Wenman. And this is he makes this on on uh, on a on the on the on a makerbot, and this is much bigger than what you can make. He makes it in multiple parts and then stacks it together, and then glues it. Fantastic. And yeah, it's, this is beautiful. This is a replica of um, of, vic of, the, of victory. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Another audience question. By... You know what though? I would also say this. Here's another Cosmo piece. This is actually a uh, Matisse that he scanned and made a copy of, and it's in, it's in bronze, and he actually made it in PLA, and then he went and he cast it, and so this is, this is made in metal. So even on the material science side, well, there are limitations for what comes right out of your maker pot. There's very few limitations for the creative person in the world. And actually, limitations can be really helpful for people to be able to push their creativity and make them think of new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Jacob Merrill here asks, how can we directly recycle the old broken world around us into printing filament? <laughs> so um, one of the challenges is there is, you know, you can go out and get cheaper filament in the world. There are people who will make it, but it's generally low quality and our biggest, our biggest problem we have when people call support is they're using somebody else's filament and it's dirty, it's got dirt in it, it's got sand in it, it's got dust in it, or it's not made to tolerance. Um, you know, our, the machine that we use to make our filament is the size of a semi-truck. So um, the cool thing is, is that it is a thermoplastic, so in theory you could heat it up and mold it into other shapes. 
it's PLA is also because it's a renewable bioplastic. You don't have to feel guilty about making stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, oh, you know, I, but there are good stories about people doing recycling. There's a group in Seattle at the University of Washington, and this is a great story. They entered a thing called the Milk Carton Derby, which is a boat race, and you have to build the boat out of milk cartons, and you're allowed to use paper milk cartons or plastic milk cartons. The plastic milk cartons are made from HDPE, which is a thermoplastic. So this group of college students actually got together and they made a ginormous 3D printer with a huge nozzle. So it didn't matter if it had dust in it. And they, I think they actually stuck all the, uh, all the, the milk cartons in like a blender. So they made it, it into like a thing and then they used an auger to extrude it through a big nozzle. And they 3D printed a boat and they totally won. Wow. And of course everybody, they immediately were accused of cheating and it was a huge controversy in that community because they had literally made it out of milk jugs, but they had sort of broken the milk jugs down into their base components, which everybody was a little bit grumpy about. But they totally made a real boat that was like aerodynamic and, and all that kind of stuff. And I just think that that's a great example of, uh, of recycling. Fantastic. Let me throw a couple of other William Hurtling uh, questions uh, at you. First one is, is there a path from where we are now to where we might see printers for the home that could print the whole smartphone yeah or other electronics in full i mean i just saw a project to make a smartphone out of an arduino so i mean i think 3d printed electronics are <clears throat> possible but the applications are probably a little bit thin right now um but i don't think it's impossible i mean I, what i would say is if you want it badly enough go out and make it <laughs> so that's the challenge. Very well. Fantastic. Let's see if our audience takes up on this. I, I, I totally cheer for it. Uh, the next question is, uh, by the way, and, and I kind of on the same topic as the next questions, the, the previous interview that I did right before you is with a scientist called uh, Gabor Forgach, who is the founder of Organovo and uh, another company called uh, Modern Metal. Uh, and those two companies specialize in 3D bioprinting of uh, either tissues and eventually hopefully full organs uh, or meat and leather. Uh, so let me ask you this again, a question by William Hurtling. Scientists are printing living tissues and structures today, mouse legs, kidney, kidneys, ears. It seems feasible that we could print replacement organs cultured from our own living cells in the not too distant future. What do you think, when do you think this will make it out of the labs and into the common practice? I mean, it'll make it out of the labs and into con con common practice when it actually works. So, um, and it can be tested and relied upon. So if it's a good idea, it'll get there. Mm -hmm. so I don't know exactly when, I can't make a prediction. I don't know enough scientists working on that. I think he would be a better question, person to answer that question since he's working on on it. But, but let oh. me ask you this though, because in a way, in a way, I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is, is this question. How do you see MakerBot in five or 10 years? Because like, I mean, in 3D printing, it seems like anything is possible, at least theoretically. So, so, and you've been like a very sort of exploding startup company. Brad Felt recommended that I talk to you. He said that he's one, one of the most excited, exciting companies that he can think of is MakerBot. Uh, so, so that's why I want to get at this. Where do you see MakerBot in five and in even 10 years from now? Maybe. You know, I think your question actually sort of is the answer. Um, you said theoretically 3D printing can do anything. So, for us in the next five years, in the next 10 years, in the next 30 years, we have to figure out what, go, what, what, what we can take from the theoretical to the, that makes sense to bring to people. Mm -hmm. So that's our challenge. And then what's your biggest dream, Brie? You know, I actually think it would, well, I've got lots of dreams, but. Give us the best case scenario, the biggest, most boldest dream that you have. But what, what's weird is probably the most, the boldest dream I could possibly have is that 3D printing would be ubiquitous and boring. <laughs> but that's not very exciting. 
<laughs> so I would say I'm looking for to, to be more exciting. I would probably say that I'm looking forward to, you know, I would love to see a solar array, solar array on the moon that could focus the, the sun's rays to a temperature that it could basically start creating the moon base. Cause I'd like to vacation on the moon. And, and hopefully the base would be 3d bio 3d printed by maker bots. I think that would be great. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And it <laughs> could help in the colonization of Mars, et cetera. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it will be very interesting to see how it's used in the space station. Bree, the second last question that I always ask of my guest is where can we find more about you and your work? What's the best place for us to sort of follow both you and your company? You know, if you want to follow me, probably the place that I'm most, the place I'm best at sharing is on Twitter. And I'm just twitter.com slash Bree. And for following MakerBot, it's the MakerBot blog, which is makerbot.com slash blog. And that's really where we do, that's where we do our best to share everything we can about MakerBot. So I'm probably easiest to follow on Twitter, and then MakerBot's best to follow. MakerBot actually has a great Twitter, too, so you could probably do, it, it really depends where you're at. If you're on Twitter, follow us on Twitter. If you read things regularly or subscribe to RSS feeds, you can subscribe to the MakerBot blog. Fantastic. And I follow you everywhere there, so both you and the company, so I, I'd Cheers. recommend that. Uh, and the final question, and perhaps the most important one for our interview today is, We've been talking for well over 45 minutes by now, and I want to ask you, what's the most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this with you today? <clears throat> you know, I think the most important thing is something that isn't about technology. It's about being able to try and try things and do it. So I would say the thing I'm most, I, I'm most hopeful for is when people take their passion and they apply a MakerBot to it. So, you know, there's stories of uh, set designer Casey Hallgren. She makes her sets now with a, maker, with, make, with a bunch of maker bots. And then on top of that, she's become an entrepreneur selling dollhouse furniture. So the stories like that and, you know, and like the RoboHand project where two guys decided to make a prosthetic hand for one of, the, one of them and shared the design. And it's now been downloaded more than 70,000 times on, on Thingiverse. And that has just empowered people to to make prosthetic hands, robo hands, that would normally cost, you know, thirty, fifty thousand dollars, cost five dollars when you make it on a MakerBot. So I think I would just, if there's any takeaway, it's, I would say, dare to dream a little bit and um, take whatever you're passionate about, take whatever you love, whether it's, uh, you know, I talked to a guy who loves Brickland cars, and he came up to me and said, "What are we going to be able to use these three D printers for?" And I asked him what he was into, and it turns out he has a Brickland car, which is this beautiful gullwing car from back in the day. And they're only made 2,000, and the radio knobs don't exist anymore. And for him, it, he, he, once, once we started to explore what was possible in his personal life, he was like, you know, if he made knobs for everyone in the Brickland car community, he would be a superhero to that community. And while that might not be something that, you know, replaces a liver, for that community, it changes what's possible. And so uh, I would just encourage people to think about whatever it is they're passionate about, add a MakerBot to it, and sort of like chemistry, when you put two things together, something magical will happen. And that's what I'm excited about. That's what I want people to take away. Brie Patisse, thank you very much for being with us today. Hey, thanks for having me on your show. Yeah.